मैडम नमस्कार और आई के सभागृह में आपका हार्दिक स्वागत है हार्दिक अभिनंदन सो आई थिंक ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स आर इगरली वेटिंग टू दिस सिंधु एंड योर बिग बायोडाटा सो आई रिक्वेस्ट एकता मैडम टू कंटिन्यू विद द फर्दर प्रोसीडिंग थैंक यू thank you so so we have got a very august personality present with us and i would uh, take this opportunity to introduce her in front of you all miss diana miss karajine is ambassador of the republic of lithuania to the republic of india before this posting she was the ambassador of lithuania to china in 2020 to 2022 she is a career diplomat with 28 years of experience in lithuania's diplomatic service having served before as the counselor at the permanent representation of lithuania at the council of europe strasbourg and the minister counselor counselor at lithuania's embassy in india also number of years at the latin america africa asia and pacific department at the ministry of foreign affairs of lithuania before being appointed ambassador to china in 2020 dynamis karachine holds a ba of philosophy a ma of history of culture and social anthropology and a diploma in international relations she has also been a lecturer on south asian history at the institute of asian and transcultural studies of vilnius university and is involved in academic activities in india studies in 2011 she published her first book all of my indias and combination of the diary of her studies in india her social observations and her academic knowledge in indian studies She has also published a number of academic articles in Indian studies, including Indo-European studies, studies of classical Indian dance, and historical relations between India and Lithuania. While on her previous diplomatic posting in India in 2011 to 2014, Her Excellency took special interest in researching historical links between Lithuania and India. especially the indian chapter of life of the famous lithuanian traveler and scholar antonas who went to india on a motorbike in 1931 and spent 5 years studying and working at the university of bombay university of calcutta and the indian museum in calcutta as a result of this research poska was granted a doctoral degree by the university of calcutta in 2014 for his contribution to indian studies and lithuania india relations her excellency is fluent in english french russian advanced beginner in hindi and spanish has completed beginner course of mandarin and studied sanskrit at the university her hobbies include reading traveling asian history and cultures history of lithuania and vilnius city big round of applause for such a great personality given with us learning so many languages and being the diplomat for so many years her excellency is no doubt a personality full of experience wisdom i would request her excellency to kindly come on the stage and enlighten all the students sitting here with her experience and her uh, talking about her uh, country Big round of applause to Her Excellency Diana Mitsarachine. director i am ki engineering college dear dr rakesh registrar i am ki university uh, 
Dear Dr. Sugandha, who worked very hard to bring me here for a number of months. We worked on finding a suitable date. Uh, dear Ms. Ekta Sharma, who has been so nice with pronouncing my unpronounceable last name, I definitely have to compliment her on that. <laughs> um, dear students, dear faculty, everybody, I'm delighted and very happy to escape the busy city of Delhi and come to a green uh, mirror to spend the morning with you. I also hope to spend the afternoon researching historical places of Meerut because it's my first visit to Meerut, even though I had spent a number of years in India, but Meerut being so close to Delhi is also a danger that you can do it anytime and ultimately you will fail to visit important places. But somebody wrote in, uh, I think the Hindu several years ago, that Meerut for Indians should be a holy place because it is a very, very important seat of historical events that once happened and shaped Indian history. I'm a historian. I was very kindly introduced, you know, with all my passions and hobbies. Uh, and um, while I have specialized in Indian history specifically, but I'm also a believer that no matter how we look forward to the future, we need to learn history because if we don't, it tends to repeat itself in, in its worst manifestations. So it's always very important for those who look to the future, who study engineering, who might study atomic sciences, semiconductors, and anything that is very modern and captivating our imagination, still to learn the basics of history, uh, to make, to set things right for the future. Uh, and I think for students in Mirat, I'm sure you all know why Mirat is special and uh, why it has this, uh, you know, special place in, in India, but also history of colonialism, history of occupations, subjugations, injustices, and ultimately liberation. Because, you know, when I started learning Indian history, Mirat was known for being the seat of mutiny. Since now we have corrected narrative, we call it the first war of independence, right? Yes. Because it's a history that has been written by the occupying side, right? So we have to develop our history. We have to know much more than it is being told in the old textbooks because history is unfortunately, fortunately, a lie. I also come from a country which has been repeatedly occupied and we have several mutinies no matter how you call it, but they remain a fact that people never agreed to, uh, you know, first the Russian Empire, then Soviet Union coming and taking us over. And when we liberated ourselves 32 years ago, there's been no looking back. I'm proudly here as ambassador of a very small country, but a very dynamic country, very rich country in all aspects, and a proof that, you know, even small countries have agency, they have a right to exist, they have a right to create a future for themselves and share whatever has been of their good achievements with all the 20 countries in the world. So, um, probably I should begin with the basic introductions, even though uh, Ms. Ekta has, has given the very basics of our geography to you already. But yes, I come from um, what would be directly about 5,000 plus kilometers away uh, from here, uh, a country near, near the Baltic Sea. So by the population, I often say in Delhi, this is like South Delhi, or probably Manipur as a state would be the, the most correct equivalent in terms of population. So we have 3 million uh, in the country. Uh, Territory-wise, it's like Himachal Pradesh, uh, and it's uh, it houses slightly less population than Himachal. So we are not congested. We are a country where you have lots of greenery. We have forest cover of over 50% in the country, and that is something we are trying to preserve. That's our small contribution to our green planet, to all the lungs that planet needs to have to sustain all the growing population. 
Uh, we are also very rich in having full-fledged four seasons. So, you know, you have winter, autumn, wi uh, winter, spring, summer, and autumn, which are very distinct. And if you look at this picture of the same place in Lithuania in four different seasons, it's going to look totally different. Uh, we also have quite a number of Indian students who come to study uh, in our universities. Despite being a small place, we have a number of dozens of good universities which offer courses from bachelor to postdoctoral uh, in English medium. So Indian students who search for affordable and quality education come to Lithuania in great numbers, especially I would say in engineering. We have uh, out of 1,000 plus uh, students, which we host every year, majority, absolutely the majority would be studying engineering, various types of engineering, uh, which I guess is a very popular subject and profession with, uh, with Indians. So, uh, especially one on a technological university has been rated as one of the pioneer uh, advanced technological universities in the uh, whole of Europe. And so it's our second biggest city, but it has become a number one city for Indian nationals uh, staying there. And uh, they are the ones who can see the diversity of the same country in the four seasons and covered in white. Even though I have to say due to global warming, it's less and less white. Uh, covered in very fresh greenery in spring. Covered in lush, colorful, flowery greenery in the uh, deep of uh, summer, which is not as harsh as Indian summer. It's normally pleasant, between 20 and 25 degrees, so it's something of a very, very pleasant climate. And the autumn, which can be rainy, which can be windy, which can be a little humid and damp for for those who live, but it is beautiful with uh, red, yellow carpet of uh, leaves that that you have uh, all over. So when I was a student in India, and I came on two occasions to be a student in India, so I associate a lot with how students travel cross borders and uh, try to adjust to a, a life in a very different culture, very different country. So when I was a student of Indian art at the National Museum in 98-99, we also had to study modern Indian art and we went to the National Gallery of Modern Art which had an exhibition of Korean artists, all in autumn colors, or yellow, red, or different shades of that. So the teacher was showing, uh, and I was probably the only foreigner at that group. The others were all Indian students. So they were showing them, look, this is the autumn color. And they were like, mm, what, does it exist? Does it really exist in nature, this beautiful yellow, orange, uh, red colors that we're normally happy to enjoy in, in autumn? So this is the, the portrait of a country, 3 million, 65 square, 1,000 square kilometers, which is roughly Himachal Pradesh. And yet, we are alive and kicking. We are a country with a rather, uh, you know, developed, uh, modern sectors of economy, which uh, would have 20% of uh, our GDP comes from uh, manufacturing, out of which half or rather 10% of economy is from high-tech manufacturing. And uh, this is, I think, our future. And this is something that I also want to tell in India because you know you are also a very brightly developing manufacturing powerhouse, which. The world has a lot of hope on India to take over as a manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, we are doing our own share. In a way, I heard, you know, and one thing that is very clear, we don't have oil and gas, not in substantial amounts. So just like India, which has some, but definitely not enough to, to develop the country. So it is an energy independent country, just like us. But what is very good, I mean, normally it's supposed to be a shortcut, right? The countries that have their own oil and gas, they can prosper just from that sector. But what it gives, if you don't have, is the, the necessity to invest in human brains, this necessity to develop intellect, necessity to really propel education, because 
it's a brain and not oil and gas that creates prosperity for any country. And while we have successful oil uh, exporters and gas exporters, but we also have a totally unsuccessful, you know, powerhouses of oil and gas which have been going from war to war to conflict to conflict, which squander the God gift that you know they have been uh, given, uh, or you know, collecting the money only in the pockets of several ones. So I think you know we have to look at shortcomings as the challenge, but an opportunity to develop beyond and to actually develop what is required for the country. That's modern economy, that's modern sectors, uh, invest into brain which would solve the problems for the country and share, uh, you know, their, their benefits uh, with the wider world. So, I think India has been doing just that on a tremendous scale. I was in India before several times. I was there 10 years ago for three years and I see India, you know, going forward in leaps and bounds with so much happening, with so many sectors developing, the most advanced sectors picking up and uh, promising, you know, to be a, 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 a super contributing partner in the global economy, of which, of course, we, uh, small countries in Europe, want to have those partnerships and, you know, have this win-win collaboration. So I will also speak a little bit about India, Lithuania, you know, relations and connections in India. But before that, I would like to say that uh, I like uh, not just the fact that India is developing very rapidly, but another fact, something that was mentioned in the ceremony to welcome me, that uh, she does it with regard to Indian values and culture. And uh, I think it's tremendous that, uh, you know, this urge and uh, uh, respect for, for culture is so much alive here because the world would be terribly boring if we lost our cultures. We are beautiful in our diversity. Um, I'm happy to represent a small country which has so many unique things that may have been lost in other parts of Europe, but we have retained it in our quieter corners of Europe. While India is so diverse, it's like a continent which has almost everything. You just name it and India, one, of, one part of India would have it. And also in terms of culture, you know, you have, uh, you know, almost everything uh, that the world starts discovering it starting the traditional sciences like Ayurveda or, or, or yoga, but uh, you know, I think with uh, very modern sciences that, that have these prerequisites. And I keep on telling my students, don't forget that zero comes from India. This is something we owe at the very beginning, you know. <laughs> so of course, uh, you really have so many things to be proud and the world still needs to understand how big and how important India is. So when I'm invited, when I teach normally at the university, so these are of course young adults who are seriously inclined to study, but sometimes I'm also invited to schools to talk to small children. So when they ask you what is India, I line them up and say now you can count up to ten and every, uh, every fifth person in that line is Indian because India constitutes one fifth of humanity. So that gives people a very good idea of what is it, how big power uh, is, is, you know, and how important is this power. So of course, uh, to us, it's very normal and very just to see India reclaiming its rightful place around the global table, uh, contributing its experiences and solutions uh, you know, in in modern world, which unfortunately experiences uh, big conflicts, big wars. We have one war just next to us, which does directly concern us, this Russian war against Ukraine. It's Ukraine's struggle to stay on the map, just exists, basically. So we very much, uh, you know, uh, sympathize with, uh, with those who have been attacked, who have been aggressed against, and we support them in in all ways we can, because we know that if there is one country less on the map, there will be less diversity, there will be less richness, 
there would be less humanity. So we all need to struggle to maintain, you know, the integrity of borders, the integrity of maps, and the integrity of uh, people's rights to exist as independent countries. Well, um, moving on to a little bit about the economy of Lithuania, I've already mentioned to you that manufacturing and especially high-tech manufacturing is uh, an important part of our, our uh, economic DNR. Uh, another big chunk of uh, economy is transportation and logistics. Uh, this has always been, uh, you know, the place, the Lithuania has always been at the crossroads between, you know, North Europe and Central Europe, between West Europe and East Europe, between the huge Eurasian continent and Western Europe. So, tr transportation, logistics, you know, moving goods are very important sector to our economy, of which we earn probably, again, another 20% of, of GDP. Um, then we also have various other services related sectors. But coming back to engineering, again I have to say that there were several fact, uh, aspects of um, sciences that we are particularly good at. So for students who study, you know, especially physics, uh, but also engineering, uh, it's probably quite important to know that uh, lasers have been traditionally the strong point of Lithuanian science, uh, public but also economy. So we have a, a number of laser companies which manufacture um, industrial lasers, scientific lasers. I'm sure that in all centers, uh, laser centers, scientific centers in India, you would find Lithuanian lasers because they have been traditionally supplying the laser research with, with the scientific equipment. And if you go in detail, there would be some specific lasers which are produced only in Lithuania. So we have that edge in certain uh, concrete particular uh, lasers. We also supply uh, lasers, uh, you know, laser cutting technologies to big producers like iPhone. So those of you who have iPhone, it's very likely that the screen on the iPhone that you hold in your hand was cut by a Lithuanian laser because you know much of, of the iPhone's screen cutting technology comes from Lithuania. Uh, another area where we have suddenly become very famous is fintech. I won't surprise you because India is very good at fintech and you have all the digital and e-payment solutions spreading widely to the, you know, to the deepest villages. But uh, in, in, in Europe, we have been also very advanced in that, and we used to be number two in European Union, but when UK left European Union, we found ourselves to be number one by, by the FinTech, number of FinTech companies, which offer quick and convenient solutions for various payment, uh, you know, payment providers in Europe. Uh, we are extremely good in cyber security and this is one area I have been trying to promote with India because at the pace of digitalization that India is undergoing, it's extremely important to have cyber security covered. One reason why we have not um, devolved e-payments and fintech solutions throughout was not because we couldn't but because we were very conscious of cyber activities which can in one go, you know, just uh, put down everything that you have been you know, using and paralyze economy. So we have been trying to balance our um, um, technological uh, solutions to cyber security. And somehow, traditionally, you know, being uh, in the shadow of a big and hostile country like Russia, we have always faced the unwanted cyber attention from Russian actors, but in the last three, four years, we have also experienced the shadow of China. And I was in Beijing before coming to Delhi, so I can speak about this. We have a problem with, uh, with, with China because we had some major disagreements, uh, but then we also receive cyber attention from Chinese actors. So now, currently, our cyber security specialists are probably the best 
equipped in the world because they have two different paradigms of you know, uh, unwanted cyber activities. So that's definitely, we are number six in the world for cyber security. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to share our experience with India, which is also, in fact, very good at cyber security. But I think the face of digitalization and the needs of India, because digital solutions to you know, touch every every common person on the street. So it's very important to speak more about you know cyber hygiene and cyber responsibilities also while using the technologies. Uh, we are very digital country generally. Depending on the year, if you look at the ratings of uh, internet speed or uh, internet penetration, you would find Lithuania at the very top of the list. One year it would be number one, another year it would be probably number three. But the fact is that the full coverage of internet is so good that it allows people to work from home, from the forest, from their cabins and cottages where they have their country house. And uh, there we started talking a lot about the sustainable living. You know, and the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, has uh, in fact announced this initiative to the world on the sustainable lifestyle. I find it very pertinent and very important that everybody listens to this very wide initiative. We are doing our own in the north, in far away, uh, to try and change our lifestyle. We consider when we really want so much in terms of consumption, whether we really want to throw the garbage, whether we really want to discard it rather than recycle and reuse it. And I think, uh, you know, we are at the juncture where we need to take these problems very, very seriously. And the population that, that you know, the numbers of population in India are especially so that, you know, this awareness about sustainable lifestyle is very important. Therefore, one other area where I look forward to cooperating with India and sharing the, you know, the little knowledge and experience that we have is on sustainable and, and green cooperation. Well, uh, some achievements have already been introduced by Ms. Ekta in sports. So that's one of the, we might be a tiny country, but we never uh, have the Olympics without several golden medals. Uh, for a three million population, five medals is a routine. Well, I mean, all medals, gold, bronze is a routine achievement. Sometimes people are unhappy if it's less than five. Uh, so sports traditionally has been uh, an important part of you know, daily life, but one sports is something that amounts to almost religious fervor is basketball, something you have uh, you know uh, figured out already. So we have been uh, at some point an important provider of basketball players or exporting, so to say, basketball players to NBA and other uh, good clubs. And the recent sports that this ECTA has also uh, figured out very correctly is swimming. So even yesterday we got a number, you know, gold medal by a, a young lady whom we called our golden fish because she just, you know, uh, kills every opponent very easily with a breaststroke, uh, you know, year after year. And uh, despite all odds, despite all the experts saying that she might be already too old, she might go back and concentrate on her family life. She just proves that, you know, there are no stops, there are no gender prejudices, like it often happens with women where somebody comes and tells what she needs to do. So I'm very happy to know that our Golden Fish has won yet another global medal, proving that against all odds this is possible. So I'm very, very much aware that, you know, the potential, the human potential that India has really uh, you know, India has won its over 100 medals in the Asian uh, Games, and I think it's an unprecedented growth in that, you know, um, orientation towards professional sports. That uh, we, we, you know, we have a very good future for for Indian medalists. I congratulate India on on the, this latest achievement and look forward to many more.
Now, uh, probably it would be nice to speak about what connects Lithuania and India and some glimpses of uh, important connections have already been uh, provided by by this actor so um, so ably. But what and probably the deepest and most mysterious connection is linguistic ties. No matter how surprising it is, no matter how incredible it is, but my native tongue, which is Lithuanian language, spoken by around four and four and a half million people around the world, three of them live in Lithuania, is the closest living sister language to Sanskrit. You don't ask me how come it is, but it's a linguistic fact which has been proven and been studied at the university. Um, despite the fact that our language has only been recorded for the first time in the 16th century, it was a spoken language, unlike Sanskrit and other old Indian languages which have a very solid you know, uh, centuries or in fact millennia old literature. Uh, but these commonalities, they go beyond the usual, uh, you know, borrowing of words trend, which has happened to Sanskrit in Southeast Asia, for example. I was visiting Bangkok recently and I was really surprised to see how many Sanskrit words are in the public domain in Thai language, because they have borrowed, they have taken these words and integrated them because of the cultural influences of Cholas and, 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 and uh, after you know, the, 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 the Indian merchants that went and settled in the Southeast Asia. However, I would, I would link goes beyond that. There are common words which are definitely not borrowed, but they simply exist. They were born like that. So we speak languages, we, language which has the primordial words which are identical to Sanskrit. Like uh, Agni, for example, is Ugnis. The fire, something that you know a human being depends on, especially in our climate where you would freeze to death if you don't have Agni. Uh, Deva is Devas. So when we pray to God, we say Deva as the same vocative uh, form as in Sanskrit. Um, rasa is aesthetic elixir or juice in Sanskrit. For us, it's dew. It's natural juice that comes, you know, in the morning on the grass and flowers. Um, vira is uh, manly or man, manly qualities. So exactly like in Sanskrit. So uh, recently we brought a street artist to Delhi. He spent about 10 days uh, decorating a wall in one of the central streets in Delhi called Mandirmar. Uh, we have tried to we have asked him to try and depict the linguistic similarity. So he painted 10 identical words on the wall in Manjir Mark. It's a Har uh, Butler, Harpur Butler school uh, you know, wall, uh, which just exemplifies this very important connection. And uh, about five years ago, we published a dictionary, a small coffee table book, which uh, also gives a flavor of that uh, linguistic um, connection which has only eight, 108 common words between Lithuanian and Sanskrit. Not because there are only 108, but because he chose it as a sacred number in Indian you know, numerology to exemplify the important connection. Most importantly, even the famous Sanskrit phrases like kastvam asi, tatvam asi, the philosophy, you know, the, the, the tenets of uh, philosophy, sound identical in our language. So we say kasto esi, to teitu esi. So, you know, it shows that the connection is very deep and beyond the words there is an amazing grammatical similarity. So when I studied Sanskrit in uh, my first and second year of the university, it was my, my own choice. I wanted to delve into this connection. Uh, I was perplexed to see how much of grammatical similarities are there in nouns, in the declination of nouns, in conjugation of verbs especially. And uh, the question remains unanswered, why, how come? We don't know. We are trying, and I'm, as ambassador, I'm trying to propel the research on that. So even this, at end of this month, I will bring uh, my Sanskrit professor who, who has offered that dictionary 
to speak to several audiences in Indian universities to propel the interest from Indian researchers also to join forces and study why and how come this connection is so strong and what does it you know tell us about our own past again past see I'm jumping from the future to the past but I remain with my own conviction that it's very important to know the past to build the future in a in a proper way. Um, you have referred to uh, somebody um, who came to India on motorbike in like almost a hundred years ago. So he's been my hero, and I spent good time uh, researching his trip to India. Uh, so he was a guy called Antanas Poshka who wanted to go to India, but he didn't have means. Uh, Lithuania was just, you know, newly independent in 1918. Uh, he was from a very poor background. He didn't have money to go as the usual rich Europeans traveled in colonial times. So motorbike was the only means that was available to him. And you imagine the determination the person would have had to travel to India on motorbike because when he set off in 1921 there were no roads in Lithuania and much of Europe he had to traverse. He went to Athens, from there he went to Cairo on a ship, from there he traveled across Middle East and he reached India. And the reason he wanted to go was to research that same mysterious connection to Sanskrit. So see how important this thing, the mystery that you are, you know, trying to grapple with in determining your future. So I want to tell you that, you know, go dig into the riddles because they might open you new perspectives. And it's very, very important to answer the questions that you might have and to sacrifice some comfort, to sacrifice some conveniences that, you know, the comfortable life in order to pursue your dream because that will definitely pay you back in whichever form and it's definitely worth it. So I also had probably the same dream because I was sick or ill with India, you know, since very junior time. I just knew I had to go and study in India, research it. And here I stand as ambassador of my country. I'm very proud that, you know, my passion paid me back in a, in a big way. And I'm very happy to contribute to whatever little I learned about my country and about your country to make those bridges for the future. So one thing is a uh, Sanskrit connection, Lithuanian Sanskrit connection, which we would definitely like to uh, explore. I also have a professor in Haridwar, in one of the universities in Haridwar, who is teaching Lithuanian language and culture. We might, you know, be open to bring her for a day or class in here because it's so close. You know, Mira is, is really not far away from Haridwar. If you are interested and there is an academic interest, we might also explore that. And I would definitely work for having a bigger dictionary, 1,008 words of you know common origin between our languages to make it, I know, uh, uh, to, to have another step in this research. We also reckon that you know our histories with India are quite similar. We are uh, not as old as India, but we were uh, created as a kingdom in the 13th century. Our king was coronated. Uh, then uh, we lost our statehood in the 18th century, and then we re 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 were reborn as a republic in 1918 to be occupied by by Soviet Union once again for another gloomy 50 years. India too has existed in uh, you know this uh, huge number of kingdoms. Uh, then it was occupied, colonized for a good over 100 years. So we reckon that we speak to Indian government nowadays that we can't have, we don't have a long history of state-to-state -state relations, but we have a very long history of people's relations, which were the bridge, which were uh, you know, making up substitute for the absence of official relations. And uh, we need to give full credit to them for keeping you know, their connection Lithuanian people were always inspired by philosophy of India. They would study it somehow. I don't even know how we would get the knowledge from India. But when we were occupied by Soviet Union, India was a big inspiration for us to 
you know, to believe that there would be one day when, you know, we will be independent again, that we will be free to, you know, study whatever we want that we can believe, we will be able to believe whatever we want. So India offered uh, being such a rich culture, so much, uh, you know, uh, values ingrained in, in Indian culture uh, that uh, we always traditionally respected India specifically for that. And I have to give credit to you for that as well. Uh, one of the personalities that we are proud to have from Lithuania was uh, a person called Herman Kallenbach, who was a uh, an important supporter of Mahatma Gandhi, of actually Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi before he became Mahatma in South Africa. Uh, he was a Jewish uh, Lithuanian who emigrated to South Africa, started earning well. He was a qualified architect. Johannesburg was building like crazy at that time. It has mines, you know, nearby. And uh, meeting young uh, Mohandas changed his life so much that he turned vegetarian, he gave his earnings to the uh, foundation that Mohandas Gandhi set up for Indians to strive for equal rights in South Africa, to support the families of uh, fighters, Indian fighters who ended up in prison and the families would be normally in distress. So he sponsored that famous farm which is called Tolstoy Farm, uh, he supported, and he was one of the very few so-called whites, I hate this word, but, you know, for, for that colonial period, who openly stood with the colored, the black, again, you know, uh, very racial terms, but at that time, they used to define communities along the lines of color. So being white and standing uh, boldly with the underprivileged uh, people, was well, something we are very proud uh, that my countryman has contributed to that. Uh, and he brought, of course, Gandhi's ideas to our shores. We became very interested and we believed in the nonviolent struggle, which actually defined our own liberation struggle 30 plus years ago. Because when in 1989 we had uh, formed this huge uh, human chain, uh, from the capital of Estonia to the capital of Lithuania with thousands of people lining up along the highway that connected three countries and joining hands so that in the 700 kilometer uh, trail there was no gap and there was no crowd also. I don't know how they did it at the age of, you know, there was no internet at that time. So we did it by radio. We coordinated by but several hundred million people of the three nations stood and held hands peacefully and said, we want freedom. Isn't it something that resembles the salt march by Gandhi? Isn't it something that resembles the peaceful uh, non-collaboration movement, the Satyagraha, that Gandhi uh, developed as the strongest possible weapon against the uh, oppressor? And I'm very happy that my countryman has contributed to that, you know, in terms of experiments with uh, ideas and, and Indian philosophy to develop the most powerful tool, tool, tool for the humanity. So, um, coming to the modern times, we, as I said, we have these powerful examples of how, despite distances, despite geographical and other distances, people reached out to each other. They wrote letters. They, they exchange ideas, and now we have all the opportunities to do much more with all the technologies that, that facilitate our everyday lives. So I really look forward to the future where we can have much more than we have now. This is a momentous year because Indian Embassy has opened in Lithuania. My country has a resident Indian ambassador since one month, and a resident embassy since six months. I'm very happy. We look forward to a totally new stage in our relationship where we will have more Indian students coming, where we will have be, be, be sending our students to study, you know, not just traditional Indian disciplines, but also the modern ones. I hope we will come to, you know, where you know, we our satellite companies are in fact sending satellites to space from the Indian Sri Hanikota, you know, base. 
So we look forward, you know, to that partnership as I term it from Sanskrit to satellites and beyond. Semiconductors might be probably the next name, the big name in terms of, of our collaboration. We might be the first, one of the first in Europe to start production of semiconductors in another four years. The factory is already being built. As we know, India is also pursuing the semiconductor mission very vigorously. So I look forward to probably stopping here because I would be happy to answer many questions that you might have on any aspects that I have, uh, you know, talked and, and beyond that. Um, thank you for listening to me very, very patiently. Thank you. So students who want to ask any question, kindly come forward. Good afternoon, Your Highness. Myself, Shreya Sharma, and I'm a journalism student. As you mentioned before, your country stands on the sixth rank in cyber security. So, how uh, I want to ask that: How safe is your country to travel there? And what is the crime rate there? And the police there is uh, are they capable of themselves, or they uh, take help from the cyber security to tackle different crime situations? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, cyber crime is an altogether different type of crime where you might not even feel that you have been attacked for, you know, before your account is the data out or whatever equipment that you are using is paralyzed. So we, there is a special uh, branch of, uh, you know, crime investigation that is called cyber crime cells that are active. Uh, in Lithuania. So I would break my answer into two points saying that my country is definitely very safe and uh, we don't have so much of police on the street but we have very, we feel very safe because the police is there working and doing job. Uh, so the crime rate is actually very low, uh, including in the capital city where you can walk at night very easily and I think the number of Indian students that is there testifies to the fact that also there are no racially motivated attacks and generally Indians are considered to be a very uh, favorable, friendly group of, of people. Uh, on, cry, on cyber crime, well, we have um, every country in fact has this uh, institution which is called National Cyber Security Response, you know, Department or Team or whatever. Uh, so, so do we. So that's India, and I recently met the head of a, the new head of a, you know, the, the, the cyber security uh, body. Um, what differs probably in Lithuania, because I have mentioned to you that we have had traditionally a lot of unwanted, so to say, attention to cyber actors in the neighborhood, mostly Russia. Uh, and recently from China, that our cyber security uh, agency is under the Ministry of Defense. So early enough, about 10 years ago, we took it as a matter of national security, not just as you know some other softer versions of security, but actually something which is of uh, you know national importance. So since then, we have had companies who have been consulting other governments and setting up their own national cyber security coordinators and I am happy to give you the example. The national cyber security response team in Bangladesh has been developed by a Lithuanian company. The national cyber security response team in Bhutan has been defended by, developed by a Lithuanian company. So we are not just, you know, managing it in a very serious way inside the country, but we are trying to help other countries to come up with their own national responses. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Myself, Raki, and I am a journalist student. My question is, how does Lithuania promote student mobility and encourage international students to choose Lithuania University? Thank you, Raki. Excellent question. Um, yes, we are promoting ourselves as a destination for studies for foreign students and there are two layers to, to the way we see ourselves. I should have probably mentioned and I forgot to say that we are part of European Union. It's 
So in all of universities in the European Union countries are related by the so-called Erasmus internal mobility schemes, which means that you might be you know, entering, joining one university, but you can easily do a semester or two in another university in another country that belongs to European Union. So your credits will be you know, counted in your home university, but you will get the exposure of elsewhere. So similarly, our universities have been receiving lots of students, from, first of all, from European Union countries, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, whichever country. And you study for your domestic fees, which means the fees that you are paying, if at all, in your home university will be applicable even if you go to a more expensive country. And the second layer that concerns Indian students is the international mobility, where we receive a lot of uh, students from uh, non-EU countries, who come, and the majority of them come and pay for the studies, but they choose Lithuania because we are, while we are considered a developed country, we have moved to status of developed country rather recently. And uh, our fees, our cost of living uh, structure is not as expensive as in the traditionally you know, Western European countries. So compared to France or or Germany or Netherlands, we are still by at least one third, if not half, cheaper. So, in that sense, we offer the same quality education for um, a you know, smaller price, which especially is visible if you study engineering, medicine, uh, you know, the, the costly um, sort of subjects where the technical base is normally very you know, important, like also uh, pilots lots of pilots, even from India, are trained in Lithuania, or if not trained, then they actually go for a short-term uh, study. So I myself had met pilots on board, Indian flights, you know, who had done their training in Lithuania. So this is how we promote ourselves. Excellent quality for a, a reasonable price. That would be best the Thank you so much, ma'am. Good afternoon, Her Highness. I am Pashri Ajmeya, a journalism student and my question is, uh, are there any culture or historical sites that students should visit to gain a better understanding of Lithu uh, Lithuania's heritage or national identity? Yes, definitely. I guess every country has places uh, one should visit to understand the culture and the history. Speaking about the culture, uh, this linguistic similarity I spoke about, it has also a separate cultural element to it. So there was a, uh, you know, we are a Christian country, predominantly Christian country. It's a secular country, so it's just that, you know, people identify with one sort of religion which doesn't really play so much, uh, you know, role in life. But we are the last Christians of Europe. It was the last country to be Christianized or baptized in the, well, the attempts were made in the 13th, 14th century, but actually the three Christian they died only in the 17th century, that's what they say. And there's a lot of remnants in our songs and folklore. So uh, when the, a very famous linguist and professor from Bengal, uh, Dr. Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, uh, took interest in the similarity of beyond linguistic cultural uh, features between ancient Vedic Indians and uh, pagan Christian Lithuanians, he actually concluded but in order to understand how Vedic Indians look like, how they create, you have to study today's, uh, you know, peasants in Lithuania because they still carry a lot of that lost, uh, you know, uh, pagan culture. So to go and see uh, the vestiges of uh, the old Christian culture, you have to visit some places in Lithuania which have uh, remnants of castle mounds. So there are no castles left, but there are just mounds which uh, symbolize, symbolize and, and depict how ancient Lithuanians worshipped, how they defended themselves. Uh, you know, several, you know, then you started the directions of, you know, addressing your prayers to different gods and so on. So these, uh, and I think we are the country, the only country in Europe which has this castle mount culture as such. We have about 1,000 of them in Lithuania. Uh, we are a flat country generally, but these mounds stand out in the, in the general landscape, making it look very beautiful. 
So I would say Castle Mount culture in Lithuania would definitely give you an insight to our culture. Thank you so much, ma'am. Good afternoon, Hi, My name is Lakshmi Mittal. I am a journalism student. I want to ask you a question. Uh, how much popular is yoga and uh, I, uh, Ayurveda in your country? I would say very popular. Uh, it's been recognized in an alternative uh, way of medicine. It's not that just that, it's also studied at the university level. We have one university which also offers insight for you know medical students into the Ayurvedic way of diagnosing, diagnosing and, and treating people. Uh, so in terms of Ayurveda, I think it is, you know, even many of the uh, treatments and medicine are available now in Lithuania. Uh, also, there is a steady flow of tourists coming to India and I'm sure all of them when leave, leaving India will carry the Ayurvedic medicine there in their suitcases. Uh, in terms of yoga, it's been also quite popular. We have, I don't know, hundreds of yoga schools, small studios that run various types of, uh, you know, various schools of, of yoga classes. Uh, sometimes it's just sort of a physical aspect of yoga which are practiced without actually going into the religious and ethos beyond yoga but it's very popular and it's very widely available so we also have huge numbers of uh, yoga practitioners going to for example Rishikesh and other places to study to protect themselves and to just uh, sort of enjoy the, 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 the motherland of yoga where it has to for, for, for the practitioners. Thank you ma'am. Thank you. Any other question? All right. Uh, Her Excellency, I would request you to kindly uh, give a token of your blessing to the students who have asked the questions. I would request all the students to come on the stage. And uh, with this, I would request uh, Registrar Sir, IMG University, Director SCM and uh, Director Engineering College, that after this, we can have a group photograph. Big round of applause for these students who have asked the questions. A token of love, appreciation and blessings from Her Excellency. I would request uh, Director SCM and Engineering College and Registrar 